I invite your attention to Romans, the sixth chapter, writings of Paul to the church at Rome. And uh, I know that text and title, Danette is always good about making sure that I have the text and title to her by Friday so we can get it in the bulletin. So I said the 15th through the 21st, but if you'll grant me the indulgence, we're going to go all the way back to the first verse of the sixth chapter. I feel like it will help us to better understand this, our topic today. What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? Certainly not. How shall we who have died to sin live any longer in it? Or do you not know that as many of us as were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? Therefore we were buried with him through baptism into death, that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we should walk in newness of life. For if we have been united together in the likeness of his death, certainly we also shall be in the likeness of his resurrection, knowing this, that our old man was crucified with him, that the body of sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves of sin. For he who has died has been freed from sin. Now, if we die with Christ, we believe that we shall also live with him, knowing that Christ, having been raised from the dead, dies no more. Death no longer has dominion over him. For the death that he died, he died to sin once for all. But the life that he lives, he lives to God. Likewise, you also reckon yourselves to be dead indeed to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Therefore, do not let sin reign in your mortal body, that you should obey it in its lust. And do not present your members as instruments of unrighteousness to sin, but present yourselves to God as being alive from the dead, and your members as instruments of righteousness to God. For sin shall not have dominion over you, for you are not under law, but under grace. That's worth repeating. For sin shall not have dominion over you, for you are not under law, but under grace. What then? Shall we sin because we are not under law, but under grace? Certainly not. Do you not know that to whom you present yourselves slaves to obey, you are that one slaves whom you obey, whether of sin leading to death or of obedience leading to righteousness? But God be thanked that though you were slaves of sin, yet you obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine to which you were delivered. And having been set free from sin, you became slaves of righteousness. I speak in human terms because of the weakness of your flesh, for just as you presented your members as slaves of uncleanness and of lawlessness, leading to more lawlessness, so now present your members as slaves of righteousness for holiness. For when you were slaves of sin, you were free in regard to righteousness." What fruit did you have then in the things of which you are now ashamed? For the end of those things is death. 
But now, having been set free from sin and having become slaves of God, you have your fruit to holiness and the end everlasting life. For the wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus, our Lord. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. William Bradshaw tells an amazing but significant story. On a sunny day in 1972, on a street corner in the busy Chicago Loop, a man stood stern-faced as pedestrians passed by, hurriedly on their way to lunch or wherever they were going. And there the man would stand, and suddenly he would raise his arm, and he would point at the person nearest to him, and he would say with a resounding voice, guilty and he would put his hand back almost in robotic fashion and stand there people stood in airy silence they looked around and looked at the man and hurriedly ran across the street after they had pretty much gone out of sight a new group of people would come to the street corner and he would pick out once again the man closest to him or woman. And he would lift inexorably the arm and say, guilty. And every time get pretty much the same reaction. What they did not know, along with this being a social experiment and a, somewhat of a gag, I suppose, he had people to walk with these folks across the street to listen to their responses. And he would hear people muttering under their breaths. How did he know? You know, it's kind of humorous, but the truth is we could all turn to our neighbors and say, how did he know? because we're all guilty. Romans 3.23 says, For all have sinned and all have come short of the glory of God. Because unless we're completely psychopathic or sociopathic, at times we all feel guilty, don't we, of some sin or the other. Well, you say, perhaps it's our upbringing. Maybe you grew up in a stern and austere household uh, that created tremendous guilt, and, and you have much unresolved guilt and issues. But, you know, there are also people that are there before the psychotherapist that grew up in extremely liberal households, and they have some of those same unresolved issues of guilt. Well, I suggest to you perhaps our guilt issues are not psychological, but are truly spiritual in nature and origin. Now, there seems to be two extremes regarding sin and guilt. One is the extreme right position. Everything is sinful. Or as the person said, why is it that everything I love is either immoral, illegal, or fattening? <laughs> Obviously, this position that everything is sin sees creation itself as ugly and cursed and dangerous and evil and everything that is not holy and has a pious glance about it is sinful. So therefore, we must have rules and laws to keep from being corrupted. And, and it's like this creation is a minefield that everywhere you walk, you have to be careful. 
Even so, that secular pursuits, since they reflect the behavior patterns of the worldly, are also sinful. I grew up thinking certain games were sinful because they had dice. I had a friend who couldn't play Monopoly because it had dice. Or there were movies, you know. It wasn't that there were movies, it was just you couldn't go to the movies. You mean your daughter or your son went to the movies? Well, my friend, TV today has a whole lot more on it than the movies did back then. Or dancing. All throughout the Old Testament, the people are excited and they're happy in the Lord, and what do they do? They're celebrating by dancing. But you can't do that. I had a seminary professor who said one of his first assignments was to go and be a chaperone at a high school dance. And their job was to occasionally walk out through the parking lot and to make sure that all participants were in the dance. And he said that he came to this one particular uh, car, and there was obviously some slight movement going on, and so he knocked on the window, the window was all, all fogged up, and, and he said <clears throat> with a strong voice, don't you think you ought to be in the dance? And then the window was rolled down just a little bit, and this sheepishly female voice said, Oh no, we're Baptists, we don't dance. <laughs> or some people like to think that evil is so easy that you can find it to a bottle and, and say, we don't drink. Or drugs or Sabbath violations. I remember we didn't uh, <coughs> mow our grass on Sunday or we didn't go fishing on Sunday. Or some have even said any kind of, when I said drug, it'd be caffeine. We don't drink coffee or tea or uh, to have to, anything to do with tobacco. We used to say, I don't spit, I don't chew, and I don't go with girls who do. You know, it was just, all, you know, and yet I can remember my grandmother used to dip snuff. Do y'all remember that? You probably didn't remember my grandmother, but you might have remembered the snuff. <laughs> Pool. We got trouble right here in River City. It starts with a P and that rhymes with C. Or C and it starts with P and that stands for pool, right? How silly. How absurd. I, I, at the first church I pastored, I, I, uh, second church I pastored, I had a pool table. And I took it and put it in the manse. You would have thought I had slain a pig on the altar in Jerusalem. And I had to explain that there is this thing called amorality. And amorality is when things are neither moral nor immoral. It's what you do with them that determines their morality. I said, I can invite young men, young women, or we can shoot some pool together and I can tell them about Jesus. And I said, and then this table becomes a moral table, or I can, if I want to, and increase my pockets by gambling on the table. And by the way, that's another thing, gambling. Oh, my goodness. You would never think of playing for a Coke on the last hole if you're playing golf or something, or a hamburger, or somebody picking up lunch, because that's gambling. Really? Gambling is when you're risking more than you can afford to lose. That's gambling, like investing in the stock market. That's gambling. Art. Wow. We don't have to get started on that. There's such crazy and bizarre art out there and rock music, all kinds of things, all kinds of ways that we can find sin and we can go everything is sinful and it's like a minefield.
You know, it got so bizarre in the history of the church that in past centuries, even conjugal relations that were purely recreational between husband and wife were said to be sinful if they were not procreative. And Augustine even wrote that procreative relations were, though not sinful of themselves, were driven by sinful passions. This kind of thinking also leads the Muslim extremists to have their women walk around looking like they're a walking tent going down the street. You know, they have everything over them, their face covered, and, and it's somewhat bizarre. But all of these opinions somewhat go against the Bible, which refutes that extreme position. God made man and woman and said, what? It is very good. And then St. Paul wrote that the marriage bed is undefiled. So those who support this extremist position, although they may quote King David, in sin did my mother conceive me, David was writing in the Psalms, I believe, to say not that he thought his mother was sinful, but rather that we are born into sin. We are sinners from the cradle to the grave. There are no exceptions. From kings to peasants, the mighty to the weak, the wisest to the most simple, we are all sinners. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. So there is that extreme position that everything is sinful. And if you're having fun, you ought to feel guilty. And there's the second, which is the opposite extreme, which is the problem today of our secular culture, and whereas the everything is sinful rec represents the legalist, who think that you're going to be put right with God just because of what you don't do or what you do. That they think that God is really so simplistic as to think that we could please Him by what we do or what we don't do. And that that would justify us before Him, a holy God. There's the opposite extreme, not of the legalist, but of the libertine who sees nothing as sinful. There's nothing sinful. Sin is an archaic concept. Religion is just used to deprive people of their freedom. Carl Menninger, a well-known psychotherapist, wrote a book called Whatever Became of Sin. Because Menninger saw patients who had guilt and anxiety that could have been cured relatively easily by confession and repentance, but sin was not considered as an option for diagnosing their problem. So the truly enlightened today believe that they are liberated from traditional beliefs and practices. They use drugs freely and have open relationships with any gender, and their behavior is without restraint. They mirror the ancient civilizations of Greece and Rome with their hedonism and epicureanism. If it feels good, do it. It can't be bad or wrong. Eat, drink, and be merry, for tomorrow we die. Or what happens in Vegas stays in Vegas. Hopefully we find ourselves somewhere between those two extremes. Because to me, both are death. Fundamental legalism kills because the letter of the law kills. 2 Corinthians 3, 6, as ministers of the new covenant, not of the letter, but of the spirit. He's talking about the law. For the letter kills, but the spirit gives life.
and just as fundamental legalism kills, unrestrained liberalism also kills because there is a way that seems right to a man or a woman for that matter. But the end thereof is death. Proverbs 14, 12 says, there's the way that seems right to a man, but its end is the way of death. Proverbs 12, 15 says, the way of a fool is right in his own eyes, but a wise man is he who listens to counsel. And Paul kind of put it another way. He said, for to be carnally minded in Romans 8, 6 is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. But then he goes on in the 8th chapter and the 10th verse, and he said, and if Christ be in you, the body is dead because of sin, but the spirit is life because of righteousness. Now, unfortunately, as was mentioned last week, our society rejects anything that inhibits the free expression of people. In fact, since perversion is a negative word no longer used by our sophisticated culture, I can remember when the word perversion was used quite freely in the Diagnostic Statistical Manual of psychiatrists and psychology when I was in the university. Today, it is not. So therefore, anything goes and passes as acceptable, and sin is considered a virtue, in fact. And old-fashioned virtues are considered evil. When you hear that word sin, when you hear that word sin, let me illustrate, because each person sees a word or an act and has a thought when you hear about that word sin. So let's just do our own little experiment here. When I say sin, what do you hear? Poison or pleasure? Dirt or naughty? Avoidance or attraction? Bondage or freedom? When Moses wrote the account of mankind's fall, he pictured the dynamic tension of flesh, of mind, and spirit. You see, as Eve was the mother of civilization, she was fully human, and she was created as a miraculous trichotomy of body, mind, and spirit. And all senses were functioning perfectly in her. She was able to see God and walk with him, and she was able to hear her husband say, don't eat the fruit. Uh, had you noticed that she did not hear God tell her to not eat the fruit? That she got that from her husband? And she then heard the warnings of death from her husband. We can't eat that. He may have even told her that you can't even touch it. But she had also saw the serpent, and she had heard him say, You won't die. You'll experience something new and exciting, and it will even make you a better person. You'll be smarter and more sophisticated. You see, eating from the tree brought to them the knowledge of good and evil. And this knowledge now held them responsible and condemned them to death. Death in the body, physical, death psychologically in the mind and soul, and death spiritually, eventually, in complete separation from God. They died immediately spiritually because they were immediately out of fellowship with God and out of relationship with Him. And then they began to die psychologically, and ultimately they would die physically. But when Eve saw that fruit, and it was so unique and different, and when she tasted it, suddenly she felt unique and different and special 
and she wanted her husband to experience that same feeling. So she offered him the fruit and said, you won't die. I didn't die. And so they were both deceived. Eve, because she didn't trust her husband, and Adam, ironically, because he did trust his wife. That's a good time for the phone to ring, really, right there, because I'm in trouble after saying that. Right, ladies? So. <laughs> Sorry. No, that's okay. Sometimes those things happen. I, I made sure I turned mine off as soon as I heard that. <laughs> the most embarrassing I, I've ever been, I was doing a funeral one time and my phone went off. And I, and I, I said, yes, yeah. it was, it's Jesus. He said he made it okay. You know, and I said, yeah, yeah. As, as we said, their senses were all functioning well. You know, when you look at the senses we have that God has given us, they're given to us to bless us. Eve could see the fruit. She could smell the fruit. She could even imagine how good it would taste. How nice it would feel in her mouth. And she could even hear the crunch in her mind. And the devil used every sense that she had that God had given to bless her to tempt her. St. John describes this attraction in 1 John, the second chapter of the 16th verse. He said it's the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. And he said this is not from the Father, but it is of the world. So we know Adam and Eve fell because they succumbed to the temptation of the serpent and because they doubted God's Word. They listened to a snake rather than listening to the Lord. And they didn't trust God's provision and goodness, and they didn't believe God's Word. And in some ways, all of sin has the essence of those three statements within it. Jesus, however, endured those three temptations and defeated the devil with God's Word. For the lust of the flesh, he chose that rather than satisfy his physical hunger by turning stones into bread, he said, man does not live by bread alone. And then he defeated the lust of the eyes. The devil told him to jump off this pinnacle of the temple that it would be a shortcut of the spectacle that he would provide and he would not have to go to the cross and all the people would gather around him and they would proclaim him as the Messiah. And he said, no, you shall not tempt the Lord your God. And then he defeated the final temptation, which was the pride of life. And that was to get the kingdoms without having to go to the cross. When he said, thou shalt worship the Lord our God and serve him only. <coughs> but we find ourselves, as in Adam, all condemned. According to 1 Corinthians 15, 22. So also in Christ shall all be made alive. So we are the mortal children of Adam and Eve, but we are also the immortal sons and daughters of God. And this is the quandary of Christians since the first conversion. This dual reality of a resident of earth, but a citizen of heaven. My friend St. Paul struggled with this as he tried to understand. He knew he was a citizen of both worlds and how he related to the reality of sin. 
His attempts to understand this dualism is explained in his letter to the church at Rome, specifically in the 6th and 7th chapters. Remember, Paul was a trained rabbinical scholar as well as a radically converted Christian. He was very familiar with the law, but he was also very aware that just obeying the law was not enough to be put right with God. So his dilemma was simply this. How to explain the fact that the law of God was good, although it condemned everyone who tried to keep it. And the second reality was equally difficult to understand. How could Christians continue to sin? How could you and I continue to sin? And yet we do, don't we? Or am I the only one that makes a mistake, does the wrong thing, says the wrong thing, Puts his foot in his mouth sometimes. And finally, is there a way we can defeat sin in our flesh as Christians? Is there a way? Well, yes, there is. To be continued next week. Let us stand together and let us sing our hymn of decision. And I hope you will be back next Sunday because we want to conclude this message. We want to share in together how we can have victory over sin in our lives. Harry.